The Arm of the Starfish by Madeline Langle, 19. This way, Molek said, and Adam followed helplessly. No, no, the man who had been trying to direct him called and pointed in the opposite direction. Molek scowled, speaking rapidly and angrily. The man responded shrilly, flung his, up his hands in exasperation and strode off. Where are, you t where are you taking me? Adam demanded. Padre Bull. There was nothing to do but go with him. Molek led Adam back to where the limousine was just pulling away to return to the airport. Parked nearby was Mr. Cutter's car. Adam would not easily forget this car, and he had no desire to get into it again. But he clenched his teeth and climbed in as Molek opened the door to the back seat. If Mr. Cutter was going to have him meet him, why didn't he tell me, Adam thought? Or is this some kind of test or trick? He looked out the window, trying to see something he recognized, trying to remember the route to see street signs, but he realized that as far as finding his way around Lisbon was concerned, he was completely helpless. Squares with fountains, sidewalks in mosaic patterns, laundry hanging, fountains splashing, all seemed to flash by him in an unassimilated, jum in an unassimilated jumble as Molek drove. Igregja, Molek said, pulling up abruptly in front of the gray stone cross-topped building on a broad tree-lined street somewhere on the outskirts of Lisbon. Though at which point of the compass Adam did not know, his sense of direction had completely forsaken him. Once he could study the map, he would feel a little more secure. A narrow cobblestone street led to a modern villa behind the church. And in this, and to this, the chauffeur pointed, Padre Ball, or Regato, Adam said, quitted the cutter's car and Molek with a sense of relief and walked quickly over the cobblestones. The villa was a handsome one, large-faced and with patterned tiles in Venetian red. He rang the bell and the door was opened almost immediately by Dr. Ball himself, who grasped Adam's hand with, in his usual overhardy grip. Dear lad, I'm so grateful you're here safely. So Molek found you, Adam retrieved his hand. Dr. Ball led him along a narrow corridor into a large study. It was a light and cheerful room filled with books and leather conveyed furniture and leather covered furniture, although it did not seem to Adam to reflect Dr. Ball's personality at all. It was no doubt the kind of study that the rector thought he ought to have. He sat down at his large leather topped desk, indicated a comfortable chair near him, and showed his teeth in a smile. He should have thought of having Merlick meet you when you talked with us last week, but alas, we did not, and both uh, Mr. Cutter and I feel that a phone call to you would have been most unwise under the circumstances, and that we just have to trust Merlick to find you. He's a very reliable fellow, though I'm sure you'd have managed to get to me anyhow, wouldn't you? Well, I think so, sir. As a matter of fact, I didn't see Molek right away, so I planned to look up your address in a phone in the phone book and then figure out how to get to you from the map. I'll tell I'll tell the truth whenever possible, he thought. And when I can't, I'll try not to say anything at all. Clever boy, Dr. Ball told him. Are you hungry? Would you like something to eat? What can I get you? Nothing, thank you. I had a good breakfast, and I've arranged to meet Collie for lunch. Where are you meeting Collie? Perhaps it will simplify things if I show you on a map and tell you how to get there. That would be fine. It's a seafood restaurant called the Saleo de Cha. He gave Dr. Ball the map, and the rector spread it out on the desk. Ah, ah. Yes, here we are, he indicated a central point. Here is the Saleo de, de Cha. Here is the rectory. If you will walk three blocks east from here, thus, you will be able to get a number 198 bus, which will take you to the Saleo de Cha in about ten minutes. Or perhaps it would be simpler just to take a taxi. Yes, yes, of course, that would be better. Well, no, thank you, sir. I think I'd rather take the bus. Why, boy? Do you not have enough money? Dr. O'Keefe had given Adam a sizable roll. He answered promptly, Oh, yes, sir, I have the money for Mrs. O'Keefe's shopping, and I have my first week's salary, so I'm fine. Dr. Ball sniffed. O'Keefe is not known for overpaying his assistants. He took a wad of bills from his wallet and handed it to Adam. We took that into consideration, of course, so let it be no problem to you. So let it be no problem to you. I really don't want the money, sir. I don't care about taxis. Carly is not accustomed to ordering inexpensive lunches. I can imagine. My dear lad, I think you should feel free to accept a little payment for what you are doing for us. I'd really rather not take any money. I appreciate your sentiments, dear boy, but accept it as a loan. If you don't need it, you can return it. But you may run into expenses you haven't anticipated. 
further arguing would be suspicious, so Adam took the money, putting it gingerly into his pocket. About the taxi, I'd really rather take the bus so I can learn my way around Lisbon a bit. It'll, it'll help me get the lay of the land. All very well and good if there's time. We shall see. Now for instructions. You have something for us? Yes, some papers I managed to get from the file when it was unlocked. Shall I give them to you? Oh, no, Sonny. No, no, no. Um, it, it wouldn't do at all for me to have the papers, nor would it be right for me to act as courier. You must understand that. I do what I can to help, of course, but my position naturally limited what is fitting for me to do. Well, then, Adam let his voice trail off. He had a feeling that Dr. Ball was leading him around in circles with his questions, his bus numbers. The rector was like a well-fed cat who nevertheless enjoys playing with a mouse. Now Dr. Ball looked at his watch. 10.45. What time are you meeting, Collie? One. Very well. An edge came into the voice that made Adam feel now that they were getting down to business. They were through playing games. Professor Embuste of... Coimbra is upstairs. I will take you to him. He rose, looking at his watch, checked it against the clock on the mantelpiece, then led Adam through the quiet house and up a flight of back stairs. Professor M. Bouste does not speak English, but his French is fluent. Yours? Pretty good. Splendid, splendid. Cutter and I were betting on it. Though we have an interpreter in readiness, we prefer not to use an intermediary if we can avoid it. He paused on the landing. If Dr. M. Bouste is satisfied with what you have for us, you will be free to meet Kali at the Saleo de Cha, where you will receive further instructions. Further instructions? Adam asked blankly. Surely you didn't think your job would be over when you had delivered the papers. You are not that naive nor that young. And it will give Professor Embuste more time to go over the papers, Adam thought aloud. He said, I really don't think it's a question of naivete, Dr. Ball. It seems to me that once I've delivered the papers, my use is over. You may be wanted for questioning, Dr. Ball started up a second narrower flight of stairs. Remember that you work closely with O'Keefe. We may need to know more than his progress in the regeneration experiments. But what? There's nothing I know. You know his habits, what time he gets up. When he is out of the laboratory, where he goes, where the files are unlocked, or when the files are unlocked, I see, Adam said slowly. It seems to me Joshua would have been lots more used to you than I, sir since he's such a good friend of yours and he's known Dr. O'Keefe so much longer. Perhaps this was a dangerous gambit, but it seemed to go along with the role Adam was trying to play. Dr. Ball cleared his throat, went up two more stairs, and paused. Although our young friend Joshua is not a churchgoer, alas, I consider that he is still within my parish and therefore my responsibility spiritually. He is lost now, and so, despite my disapproval of his way of life, he is really no fit companion for you. I must never abandon him. I would really prefer it if you did not see him. He hurried up the last few steps, walked down a short hall, knocked briskly at a door, and opened it to reveal a small, almost bare room. At a desk sat a man with a sallow, intelligent face. An unshaded light bulb hung over the desk. It reminded Adam of the room in the airport in Madrid. Without making any introduction, Dr. Ball closed the door on Adam and disappeared. Adam could hear his footsteps descending. The sallow man looked up. Embuste? Adam Eddington, Adam said, looking at the professor. Professor Embuste glared back. The corners of his mouth turned down in a bitter and unwelcoming expression. Adam was becoming accustomed to being examined, so he stood his ground. Professor Embuste did not ask him to sit down. Without moving in his chair, he said, The papers, please? Adam handed them across the desk. You will wait, the professor said sourly, while I look at them. Adam stood, watching the professor go through the papers, eyes flicking quickly over the formulas. Those eyes, small, close-set, dark in themselves, and darkly shadowed, seemed to Adam to be, a sh to be sharp, cruel, and frighteningly intelligent. Minutes moved, and Adam did not dare check his watch. He shifted uncomfortably from one foot to the other, but Dr. O'Keefe had prepared the papers well. Professor Embuste put them down on the desk, looked at Adam, and said, Very well, you may go. You will receive further instructions at the Saleo de Cha. Adam felt that he could not get out of the small trap of a room quickly enough. He opened the door and came face to face with Dr. Ball. If the rector 
had descended audibly, and he had come back up the stairs in his stocking feet, putting a finger to his lips that were curved in a peculiar smile. He led Adam to the front door, then took his hand in, in the too strong grip. My dear good lad, I am immeasurably relieved that all is well. You still wish to take the bus? Yes, please. You remember the number? 198. Bright boy, we will be in touch. Adam's hand was pumped. Blessings were rained upon his unwilling head, and he fled down the street. At the bus stop, a lonely young man waited. He wore heavy horn-rimmed spectacles and carried a pile of books under his arms. He beamed at Adam and said in studied English, A million pardons, but are you an American? Yes. I am a student at the University of Lisbon, and I'm taking courses in English language and literature of England and America. It is always my deepest pleasure to talk to students from either of, those, of these great countries. The light glinted against the spectacles so that Adam could not see his eyes. I'd like to talk to you, Adam said, trying to sound courteous, but I'm in a terrible hurry. I'm off to meet a girl, and the last time we met, well, we had a misunderstanding, so you see, his voice trailed off. The bespectacled student waved his books gleefully. A lover's quarrel? How delightful. So, of course, I understand that you are not interested in my idle chatter. Adam was spared a reply by the arrival of the bus. 198, what luck, he thought gratefully. He smiled, waved courteously jumped on and ran up the stairs to sit in one of the front seats on the upper deck, then looked down the street. The student was no longer at the bus stop, so presumably he had boarded the bus too. But he did not come upstairs. Adam alternately checked his watch, or Adam alternately checked his watch and the map. It was already 11.30, but with luck he would be able to manage a phone call to the San Juan Chrysostom Monastery. He felt a terrible need to be in touch with Canon Talis. Something about Professor Embuste had frightened him, and although the false papers had for the moment been accepted, the boy knew that the professor must now be going over them more carefully. He left the bus, the Temis papers seeming to burn in Maria's pocket, bumped into several young people who pushed out ahead of him and stood clustered on the sidewalk. He knew the papers had not been touched, but he still felt panic. The young people stood talking together animatedly, and he was not sure... Whether or not he was imagining sidelong glances, some of the glances came from girls, and to this he was moderately accustomed. But was the boy with his back turned, the young man with glasses? Was Adam being watched as he walked quickly down the street? It was not yet twelve. He knew from the map where the restaurant was, but to walk there before calling would be cutting the time too close for comfort. He went into a small hotel and found a phone. It was not in a closed booth, but no one, as far as he could tell, had followed him in. He struggled with the phone book and managed with considerable difficulty to find the number for the Sao, from the Sao Juan Chrysostom Monastery. With the help of, his, of the phrase book, he was able to give the operator the number, and after a good deal of clicking and clacking, he heard a distinct ring. Then came a rough voice, and Adam said, Señor Paraco, Padre Henriquez, por favor. There was a long pause. during which Adam felt that everyone in the hotel lobby was staring at him. This, he knew, was not likely, and he would not be alert to the people who might really be following him if he was suspicious of everybody else. A gentle voice, an old voice, sounded in his ear. Padre Enriquez. Adam Eddington, Adam said. Canon Tylus, por favor. Momento. A shorter pause and the familiar brusque voice. Adam! Yes, where are you? Lobby of the hotel... Samamide. How much time do you have? Oh, how much time do you have? Until one. Lunch with Callie, then. Yes. Are you being followed? I'm not sure. Maybe I'm being too suspicious. I doubt it. Leave the hotel and turn right down Rue Samamide. Go into the coffee shop at number 28, over the occultist. I'll be there as quickly as I can. A wave of relief broke over Adam as he hung up. He found the coffee shop without trouble climbing a steep flight of stairs to a long, narrow room filled with small tables. The table by the window was empty, and he sat there, looking out over the enormous gold spectacles that signified the occultist's office shop below. Across the narrow street were more shops, a tobacconist, a music store, a shoe store. Down the street, which seemed purely commercial, he saw the ubiquitous laundry hanging out. He ordered coffee and tried to appear relaxed and casual, 
but he did not keep from looking out on the street. He did not know from which direction Canon Talus would approach. So he would take a sip of coffee and look up the street um, and look up the and look up the street, another sip and look down the street. He was looking down the street, leaning forward, thinking he saw the cannon in the distance when somebody sat down opposite him. And he turned, thinking he must have been mistaken to be met by the beaming face of the student from the bus stop. But what good fortune to come across you here, the student cried. Perhaps I can be of assistance to you. It would be my, my unutterable delight. Where is your, what do you call it, girlfriend? I'm meeting her in a few minutes. Words came quickly, almost without thought, to Adam's lips. The bus was faster than I expected, and I don't want to be too early. Bad for them to think you're too eager, if you know what I mean. The student giggled convulsively. Oh, <laughs> you Americans, you steal our girls right out from under our envious noses. We are so poor that it is difficult for us to sit on the surface to compete with you. And below the surface, the student shrugged apologetically. America is a rich country and life is easy for you, but the ability to love a woman and to please her to the ultimate fullest comes only through centuries of experience and suffering. I think that in the inner matters of the heart, you have much to learn, he beamed at Adam as though he had paid him a great compliment. A dark figure moved deliberately by Adam and the canon seated himself at the next table so that Adam faced him and the student had his back to him. Adam felt a moment of frantic frustration. He had a wild impulse to take the Temis papers from Maria's pocket and give them to the canon then and there. Canon Talus looked at him, raising what, if he had any hair, would have been eyebrows. Adam stood up, saying rather loudly to the student, Well, it was very pleasant meeting you. It's time for me to go to my girl now. He could not resist adding, and I assure you that I, too, have more charm than money. The student burst into roars of laughter, slapping his knees in enormous appreciation. Ho, ho! Oh, 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 he rose too. Perhaps it would amuse you if I walk along with you and show you some of the particular points of interest, but you haven't had your coffee. The student shrugged and waved his arms in, wind in a windmill gesture. Coffee, I can have any time. The chance to exercise my English and simultaneously talk with an American is rare. Where are you meeting this lovely girl? At the Saleo de Cha. The student made a face. The Saleo de Cha prefers money to charm. Oh, well, you know, Adam said. Girls, girls, I won't eat for a month. Behind the student's back, Canon Talus slipped and moved silently. Phone. Adam's eyes met his for a brief moment of acquiescence. Then he paid for the coffee and left. And that is the end of chapter 19.